Okay, welcome to the second part of today's session. This is about a presentation I prepared on scientific presentations and giving a uh, planning structure and giving these professional presentations in a scientific, uh, for a, usually in a scientific context, but you can also apply these if you do not end up working in a scientific context uh, to make professional presentations in an industry context or anything where you need to uh, be the expert uh, for some topic. So this uh, quote that I've shown earlier, now we we'll go into it, uh, is from the uh, late MIT professor Patrick Winston, who said, <clears throat> students shouldn't go into life without the ability to communicate. Their success in life will be determined largely by your ability to speak, your ability to write, and the quality of your ideas in that order. So with that being said, I, I would personally say I highly agree with this. Um, as this is uh, the world we live in and uh, a lot of uh, research and also large projects that happen aren't done by individuals anymore. So if you look historically, we know of many uh, single people uh, uh, that did really, uh, really, really great work um, uh, on their own. But these days, science has gotten so complicated that we mostly need and for in order to present your ideas in teams and to get support for these teams, you need to be able to communicate and for that you need to speak and write and also have good ideas. So with this course for, for today, we'll cover the topic of uh, speaking. Next week, we'll talk about uh, writing with the scientific writing part. And uh, overall, with the session after that, on the effective literature research, I hope I can help you also improve the quality of your ideas. So what is the goal of even giving a presentation? It is uh, to explain your ideas. You have you are a scientist, so you think in what uh, co uh, complex stuff or abstract things that are not easily understood by other people if they're not also uh, in your field or haven't worked on the same things that you did. So you need to be able to explain these ideas in some form. As you are all uh, students or uh, young scientists, you need to uh, still prove yourself as professionals. So prove yourself in front of some hierarchies or um, uh, that you can do such qualitative work. So this is also part of why you should be able to present and of course to sh show your work, to present what you have done, what you have accomplished. So for that, I've prepared this presentation in the following parts. Uh, first, we'll talk a bit about planning, then about structuring. This is one of the parts that's usually the most forgotten when, uh, uh, when doing presentations. Then a bit about uh, slide design, uh, then about talking, a short section, and then about feedback. Uh, then I will give a short conclusion of this talk. So starting with uh, planning. So this is um, a step-by-step -step plan that we will uh, uh, continue to use throughout this presentation that you can, ho can hopefully also use throughout your presentations to prepare for your uh, own presentations, for example, for this course, also for other courses. So uh, I will cover each of these steps in detail. So we will do some pre uh, preparation, just assessing the context, determining the occasion. Then we will do the actual research work. This is not uh, significantly covered in this presentation. This will just be a single step uh, because we are not talking about that here right now. Then this a st a structure pre preparation. We have some, um, uh, we cover some, tech, uh, some basic and some more advanced techniques for this. And then creating the slides and finally practicing your talk. So uh, please, while it might be um, attempting to just skip to creating slides uh, or to skip preparing the structure or any of these parts, please do not skip any steps. So these are the sort of basics, and if everything fails, we still have the basics. So please do not skip any parts in this plan. So starting with the first part, answering some basic, basic questions about the context. Some of these you might all be already able to answer from my earlier uh, talk about the organization of the course. So the length of the talk, well, you know, 15 minutes, 25 minutes. Okay, type of talk is a project presentation in this case. When you speak, which slot, yeah, we will determine those time slot as we have here. So sometime between 14, 15 and uh, what was it? 15, 45, yeah. Other, other speakers, yeah, there are other speakers and these are your fellow students. You can also see which topics they will hold via the web page. Set standing hierarchies, yeah. So uh, present hierarchies will be uh, definitely myself. Uh, and in most cases also Professor Kunkel uh, as a major hierarchy uh, your status and standing is, of course, in this case, a student. So this is just an example. I will go over, I'll go over this right now. Uh, if you give a presentation any other context, 
you should also go over this list. For example, here in this case, you're giving a presentation in front of a, a hierarchy in front of a professor. Uh, in in other contexts, maybe uh, where you're called as in as an expert, you might be giving a presentation in front of a novice audience or where you yourself are considered the expert. It's also something that might uh, might happen earlier or later during your career, depending on the direction that you are going. And then there are some questions regarding uh, the physical uh, format, online or offline, in this case online. So you will be uh, looking at a similar presentation from your fellow students and yourself, as you see here right now, rule size and form. Yeah, it's giving you a big button in this case. If you do end up giving a presentation uh, in a physical location, you might consider these aspects uh, in terms of distance to audience, your mobility on stage. So what kind of gestures are you able to make in this online format, for example, if I'm so if I make gestures with my hands, if I do them usually down here, you don't see them. If you physically put my hands up here so you can see them, so this is part of this visibility part here. Uh, available media equipment for displaying the slides. So yeah, please make sure that you test beforehand, for example, this big button, that your camera works, the microphone works, that your slides work. Um, in a physical location, you would do the same. Uh, then the topic of dress code, okay, with these online settings is pretty casual. You can mostly wear whatever you want. Please do not sit in your front of a camera half naked. It might be a bit distracting, but if you give a presentation in, a, in, a, in person, for example, at a conference, uh, you should consider what dress code is appropriate. This might be predetermined by the event itself, uh, or you get to choose. Uh, personally, rule of thumb, it is harder to uh, uh, be overdressed than it is to be underdressed. Uh, but the dress code overall should be something that makes you feel both comfortable and confident. So comfortable enough, so nothing that's too tight, like a suit or a dress uh, where you can't, um, where you don't feel comfortable, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that make you feel uncomfortable, or shoes that are uh, uncomfortable, something that makes you, yeah, that makes you feel comfortable enough to give you your presentation, but also confident enough to stand in front of a crowd uh, for to or able to, to, in order to give your presentation. Then uh, checking uh, with the next part, uh, looking at the occasion. So what is your audience? Who is your audience? So I hope for the next few weeks, we get about uh, 10 people in here for the presentation. So I would say so five to 10 people uh, should be the audience size, or at least for this course. General mood. So this is um, related to uh, multiple sub aspects. Here we have the fatigue of the audience. So time of day, I would say right, off, right now, we have, the, for example, the afternoon, early afternoon. People are starting to get a bit tired, I would say, if they have been working since early on. They're not super tired yet. Uh, that's not, the, I would say, the optimal time to give presentations. We have to consider your audience is not fully there, uh, not, but uh, you can still expect some good engagement from them. Then uh, general opinions on your topic is there, depending on what context you present. Um, most of your topics that we uh, dispute here shouldn't be controversial, but this is again something that in general I want to teach you uh, is that you should consider is, is the topic I'm presenting, is it somewhat controversial for that crowd I'm going into? Because then you will end up being more on the defensive compared to a crowd that supports your topic, where you can just uh, go high and show what uh, the progress is made and what potential is there. So then uh, conflicts with the audience can or should also consider uh, either within or personal or professional conflicts as, these, um, uh, as you don't want them to drag down your presentation. Uh, then the competency of your audience is something I mentioned earlier on in terms of who you should consider uh, that you're writing. So in this case, consider your fellow students as the audience. So this their level of confidence, so they have some good understanding of computer science, as they have, uh, have, uh, as they're working on a master's degree, have completed a bachelor's degree, probably in computer science or at least some experience in the field. And then could, could the relation of the audience to your topic, so they might have some basic ideas of it, but they're not working specifically on it. So they're not, for example, not up to date on the newest ideas of it. Um, so you, and you also need to maybe uh, first uh, get their attention on it. So getting the interest of the audience is something that is also a major focus of presentation that we'll cover more on later. Then uh, consider stakeholders mentioned hierarchies earlier. Hierarchies and stakeholders, depending on the context you are sitting in, might not be the same. Um, so, so I think about some specific examples. Um, either, uh, either we have maybe the crowd itself is other stakeholders, maybe uh, you have, uh, your boss or some uh, other colleagues that are stakeholders, 
uh, if you're in an industry context, and of course, the interest of the audience. So this is a presentation they're looking more, more looking forward to or do we need to first catch their, so they've been coming in, of course, they've maybe even paid to go there or they uh, travel to go there to their presentation or they've chosen to be at your presentation over some others uh, or are they there because um, they kind of have to be for an expectation. For the business course, there is an expectation for you guys to be at every presentation. Um, um, as you would also want them to be at your presentation to give you feedback, to learn from the feedback that we give you. So then uh, I should also consider the goal of your presentation. So in this case, you need to sort of prove yourself that you have understood this topic and that you can teach or at least um, present the work uh, you have done in your topic. But these might, uh, might be different uh, goals depending on where you end up doing presentations overall. So maybe you to present your work, you made a solution for a common problem. So maybe the audience already knows the problem and say, yeah, we did this. So the focus would be on very details of uh, this, to show them how the solution works. Maybe you talk about something uh, uh, to change their mind or uh, they should start doing something. These are sort of call to actions. They have uh, often a more political connection where political speech might be uh, end up in a call to action where the, you want your audience to uh, actively do something where we, after we have, uh, after you're done talking to them. You can also think about what does success mean? Like who do you need to convince of what ideas in order for your presentation to be considered a success? Uh, depending on uh, where you stand in your research work. So for example, in this case, you don't know your topic yet. You haven't done any work yet. You don't know yet if you need to consider any of these parts. If you are, if your work ends up being, uh, I can make a recommendation. If you work uh, with this software, you should always use these settings or you should never use that software. Use always use that, that, uh, that other library. You uh, might need to come back to this and more research if you want to include such a call to action or some recommendation in your work. So then what to include and not to include. So assuming you've now done your research, we have just from this step to this slide, we've now done your research. So if you gathered all the materials, we have now sort of a super set of all the information that we can include in a presentation. So at this point, we consider once again, the length of a presentation and the competency of the audience. And then think about what's digestible. So this digestible is a key aspect. What information can we reasonably expect our audience to learn over the course of the presentation? Based on that, we should decide what to include, but also what to leave out. So say you have maybe three major things that you found out throughout your work, but for the format of the presentation, you only find that well, going through all three is too much. Let's just do two of them and then uh, leave the last one out and just put it into, into the report. This is perfectly fine to do it. So should always consider what's suggestible over the length of the presentation for the audience and also what's interesting to them. There might be some technical details that are interesting that uh, to someone who wants to replicate your work, then put it in the report, but it's not necessary to put in the presentation. So with that, we have now completed the first few parts of the step-by-step -step plan. We're making good time on this. So we assess the context, determine the occasion, and uh, with this very quick step, uh, two slides ago, we have also done our research or prepared our content, collected all the information uh, that we need. We said we go into structure. So with structure, I would uh, uh, tell you about a technique called ABT. Uh, talk about the hourglass structure of, uh, that's common for presentations and then uh, some more common uh, structure um, aspects. So starting, I would like, uh, I would start with this uh, statement. <clears throat> From a human perspective, there's no major difference between telling stories around a campfire and giving a talk at a conference. Humans are best able to remember information in the form of stories. I would like to let that settle for a moment. This story format, this idea is that uh, information are best processed as stories. So that's why, uh, what's the focus of the structuring? So all, all the uh, instruction that happens afterwards now uh, is about that we uh, identify how we can create stories from the information that we have to present. Because it's how our brains over millennia have been, or not more, even more than millennia, have been forged that we uh, always, uh, listen, that we sit around campfires and listen to the stories of our fellow cavemen. And that is how we best remember this information in the form of stories. So have some logical lines, some red lines throughout whatever we're presenting. You don't need major um, a plot twist or so in your presentation. You can, that's something we'll talk later about. You can have some minor things there, uh, but uh, especially in scientific work, 
you uh, things should be mostly uh, expectable. So then uh, this ABT that I mentioned, and but therefore. So this is the basic of uh, most uh, of these short stories that we we're going to tell. So going through ABT loop. So we have this end, we set up the status quo, set up the introduction, we set up what is the current situation right now. Then you say, okay, but there's a problem. There's our but part. There's something that we don't know, something that's important, that's something that if you don't address it, will become a, even a bigger problem later on. Then we say, okay, therefore, I've come with a solution uh, or some implication or something that we have to change. Uh, and therefore, we should do this and that. Or therefore, we have done this and that. Uh, then when we said, we have already completed a, one, uh, a single ABT loop. This basic loop, you will probably end up doing multiple times in your presentation. So consider how you can uh, fill your uh, the materials that you have prepared into multiple of these loops. So connecting them together uh, into uh, these uh, loops and uh, printing your content into it. So this is still like we are still a few slides away from uh, slides away from doing how, uh, from creating slides itself. So we're just doing this all on paper, doing in our notes, just writing. Okay, this is our first loop. This is status quo, but therefore, okay, these information connect them together. Put it, uh, we'll later on put it on a few slides. So this is about ABT. Now going to this hourglass. Hourglass says we have a broad intro, a tight body, and a wide conclusion. So with the introduction, you want to capture this of the audience. So considering that the audience, as I mentioned earlier, might have some base interest in your topic, but uh, not too much, or have low or a high interest, you need to capture the interest somehow. Uh, we talk about techniques for that uh, in the next few slides. Then we have the body, where we present the necessary information for them to understand uh, your arguments, your major points. And uh, you shouldn't add too many details to it, just focus on these major points, as too many information would be overwhelming for them. And then at the end, you have a conclusion, where we summarize uh, what uh, the audience should remember. There's this uh, common saying that you might have heard uh, before, you tell them what you will tell them. This is what happens in the introduction. You tell, uh, you tell them. This is the body and tell them what you told them. This is the conclusion. So going to, with the introduction. So we first need to get the interest of the audience. So somehow we need to um, have the audience relate to your topic. So get them, give them an idea how is this, what you are showing to them uh, or will show the, to them relevant. We can even include maybe an, uh, an image or a picture, uh, a picture or a video, uh, which is uh, somehow thought provoking or sh even shocking or has some no emotional reaction. Uh, for them, or it's just impressive in its own right. Uh, you can connect to current events. So if there's some, uh, something in the news or the current recent developments uh, that uh, people have heard about, uh, then you can connect to that. Uh, if there's nothing that regards, you can also connect to it. It has been 80 years since uh, this event has occurred and we have not fully understood uh, its consequences, but here's a bit uh, more in that direction uh, what we have figured out now. This would be a connection to a historical event or date. Uh, also, or you could uh, connect to a seemingly simple question um, by ask uh, by saying there's some common knowledge in our field, and then you ask a yeah a very a simple question that has a complicated answer, and with that you set up uh, for your, set up your presentation. So engage your talk with enthusiasm. Uh, so having so showing that you have it's yourself some basic interest in your own work. Otherwise, it's uh, difficult uh, to get someone else interested in it if you not, do not care yourself. Define what like uh, your, either your achievements from your work are, so present what you have done, or what the benefits of the audience are, what they can learn from this presentation. You hint at a take-home message. Take-home message or something that we'll discuss uh, more in a few slides. This is about um, what you want your audience to learn. If they don't learn anything from your presentation, what is the one thing they should take home uh, anyway? And then you give an overview, some introduction for your overall talk. So if you look back at how it started this talk, either by switching back in the slides or uh, rewinding the recording, you will see that this is exactly how structured the introduction for this talk. I talked a bit uh, about um, what this uh, quote at the beginning to get a bit of your int uh, interest and hopefully engage you with enthusiasm. Like why should you uh, even care about this? Like what benefits do you have? I hinted at uh, some take home messages like what you will learn from it. And then at the end, I give this overview of the rest of the talk with the structuring. So uh, then talking about the body, uh, the body of the, uh, of the talk. 
uh, the, uh, the general rule is that to keep it uh, simple. So um, with a clear structure where you have uh, often, you for example, have an argument or an aspect, and you have then you put in three sub arguments for it. Uh, why is this is true? Why is this is important? Or so on. Uh, the general rule for the structure it would be to put the second strongest first to make uh, sort of an impact, the weakest in the middle, and then to keep the one that it stays in mind would be the strongest at last. But this is just uh, one idea how we can do it. So some alternative structures you can yeah, just make a chronological retelling of the events. This depending on your topic or um, what you're talking about, it might be more fitting. You can have pro contra, so showing both sides of a of an uh, of a conflict or um, of a discussion, or the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis synthesis uh, aspect, where you present uh, idea, contra ideas, and combinations of those. How these end up. Um, providing a better solution overall. And uh, once again, there's also, of course, ABT, which can be used in combination with any of these. So yeah, the idea is, once again, overall to find a way to put your idea, uh, put the material you have, what you have prepared into a story that you can tell to your, uh, your audience. Then the conclusion is a rather short part, but nevertheless uh, very important since it's the last part. So we should uh, do a summarization where we focus on the achievements, like what have you done, what have you contributed, or what are the benefits now. Um, then appeal, make an appeal to the audience, uh, say, hey, now you can do this, or uh, and uh, uh, like this call to action point once again, and then give your takeaway message. As mentioned, with tell, tell them what you uh, what you will tell them, tell them, and tell them what you will told them. Uh, this is, of course, as a rule, the first impression makes an impact. So that's why you need to get the interests of the audience in the introduction. And the last impression, that's what we do in the conclusion, is what stays in the mind of the audience the longest. So then, uh, with that, we have now talked about this uh, body and uh, structure. I will now talk about some common structure elements, starting with the take home message. So uh, if you give a presentation, especially a long presentation, I've been talking about 20 minutes now about this topic, and you probably can't remember what I said like 10 minutes ago. Like maybe the rough outline, maybe the details, but not, not the details. Uh, for that, we will need to go back to the slides or through the recording. So for that point, uh, purpose, we will need to consider what are, the, what are the major key points that I want the audience to remember. And then I need to design my presentation around these points. So I need to cons uh, delib deliberately consider what are these take, uh, take away or take home messages in my uh, work? What are the major points that I should, uh, they should keep in mind? Uh, what maybe this is a call to action. And you can then, uh, you can't hint and um, uh, repeat them often enough throughout your presentation. Just consider these uh, put in take away messages often uh, and connect them to your ABTs. So the, especially with the therefore part, you can then uh, uh, hint at your um, takeaway message for that section of your talk. Then uh, keeping interest high. So we've now talked about the introduction where you can uh, capture the interest of your audience, but you need to keep it so you don't lose it throughout the uh, presentation. In general, it's, if you are example, if you are reading an article, the author needs to capture your interest to continue reading at, at first until they have convinced you that you want to finish reading the article. Similar to with uh, similar to this with the presentation. You to um, first capture the attention of the audience, and then make sure that they uh, keep up the interest uh, until they are uh, dedicated enough to finish it throughout the end. For that purpose, would create, uh, you can create an identification. So it's not you versus the audience, not uh, not you are defending everything that you do for, uh, in front of the audience, but it's a, a we. No, so we are all here to learn together. I'm not talking down to the fellow person who tries to learn more about giving presentations, someone who has now prepared this talk in order to learn more uh, about this topic myself, and uh, someone who wants to empower you and uh, us together to enjoy more qualitative presentations. Then embody optimism and motivation, enthusiasm about your own work. This is, um, you want to be uh, able to, um, uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, Think about the English word now. You want to uh, give off the impression that uh, there's something interesting in your work, uh, something that uh, the audience, uh, yeah, audience should also want should also want to learn about. 
if you're not excited about your own work, then um, yeah, it's hard to be uh, excited for your audience as well. Uh, there's a, some line somewhere out there. Um, it's more some e somewhat easier for some people to hit and for others, where you become overwhelming. Uh, try not to hit this line. This is when you start talking about too many details because you're so excited that you can uh, you want to tell them everything all at once, and then uh, that doesn't work out that way. You can create tension, so this comes back to the storytelling, uh, using volume, pitch, emphasizing important points, uh, not having a monotonous voice that talks about everything in the same voice without emphasizing anything. That's, it, it's even hard for me to do uh, because I start emphasizing uh, at least the end of sentence. So um, use some volume, pitch, project your voice, especially for important parts. And uh, let's, let's, let's call it here, let something happen. Make, maybe even uh, put in such a, a small trot, uh, plot twist uh, reveal in your story, which is uh, interesting. Um, because it's quite also connects to the next point where you would put in some surprise, at least some aspect that is not uh, implicit, it's not well, super expected. Uh, again, it makes the story overall more interesting. It should not take away from the scientific soundness of your work, but uh, it can be uh, used to make the work overall more interesting. For example, with a, did you know that there's some interesting fact about your work that makes it, um, um, that uh, is uh, unexpected, I would say, or refute something or ask uh, rhetorical questions and so on. So there are many ways to do this. this is just some uh, basic ideas. Uh, as you notice, we're going now into more and more advanced aspects of this, uh, of, of this crafting these stories. If you are just getting started with presentations, I would say go back to the first few parts, focus on these ABTs um, and uh, together some experience with it, with that before you uh, try to employ everything at once that I'm talking about here. So for the next part, engaging your audience's brains. This is also something that's a bit more advanced. So uh, if you talk about uh, your presentation and you just give all the details that, uh, and the text in these uh, when seen until now, it's mostly that your left hemisphere and the left half of your brain is working because it's all the rational and analytical stuff. To fully engage your audience and to also enable them to learn more about your uh, topic, you should also try to engage their right hemisphere to fully engage their brain with it. Uh, there are multiple ways to do that. Give them something emotional, intuitional, tension, unexpected, as I mentioned here. So, for example, um, if you tell them some technique that you, uh, that you use throughout your work, then we show them a picture where, uh, where you, this technique can be applied. But instead of saying immediately, yeah, we applied this technique uh, to this data set or to this picture, and you, uh, we found that there is something here that's interesting. Don't Show it, uh, show it to them immediately, just give them the technique and then show them the picture and their minds will intuitively try to apply the technique to the picture. And then you'll say, okay, you guys noticed? Yeah, there's something there uh, using this technique that we have just shown you. So to have them somehow work with the material that you have, not just talk it, not, not just present it to them. Have them somehow engage with it themselves. So let's, uh, as I mentioned, the last point here, let the audience think and feel about your topic. So with that, our step-by-step -step plan is making good progress. We are now at uh, the uh, slides part. Uh, we have now completed our structure and have some idea uh, where we want to put all our content. So now we just need to uh, put into slides it on it to make them look really nicely. Maybe move them around a bit, uh, but otherwise uh, we are all almost set to uh, uh, complete our presentation. <clears throat> So going into slides, I've split it up into two parts. For first up, we have some guidelines on how to in general design slides. Then I have some gotchas in, in terms of things that um, seem simple at first, but are apparent, uh, are, can be done uh, incorrectly really easily. Um, so starting with it, uh, design goals. If you do a presentation and you use slides for your presentation, because you can also do presentation without slides. But if you do have slides, it should be supportive to whatever you are telling them as a speak, uh, you as a speaker are telling them. And you should deliberately guide the attention of the audience. So having the slides, for example, contain a major image, you can guide your attention of the audience across that image, show them different parts of it and so on. Uh, this is one way to do it. An incorrect way to do it would be to show them a slide, which takes long, long uh, lots of effort to digest uh, because it's, for example, full of text. 
and not even just like bullet points as we see here, but block text. And that's like, you have to read line by line to understand what's going on to, uh, and then you're still talking to them. Of course, it doesn't work. You can't also, like if you're right now checking your emails, trying to listen to me, you for, for your brain won't fully understand either of it. Either you will understand your email or will send what is another. So that's why um, guide to the attention of the audience. Don't make this, uh, make the multitask in your presentation. Try to uh, be deliberate about what they should be looking at, what they should focus on. And uh, the slides can be a great support for that, especially to visualizations. And the last part I mentioned already is making content digestible. So just giving, talking about something uh, in person might uh, be uh, difficult. So we have these slides to allow them to uh, have these sort of checkpoints, which I mentioned also later on, or have some visualizations uh, to support your work. So some con considerations when preparing slides. So with the earlier slides, you saw it was really focused. You had to receive three points. You can just easy, easily load off all of that in your mind. You, you have most of probably read it all just from a single glance. It's like 10 words or something. And, uh, but with this slide, it's much different. With this slide, we have lots of elements. All of, uh, all of this text is taking away part of your attention. So if I want to focus you on a single part of this, I, uh, on uh, something important, I would put less elements on a slide. Because we are in a digital age, like we could just split up a slide into multiple parts if you want to uh, have better focus on individual ones. So don't make the slides too full. Only show what's necessary. Um, one technique that you can also use, um, uh, but it shouldn't abuse, is this sequential revealing. I don't have the idea is that you would, for example, on this slide, only show the first major part, then you show the next uh, major bullet point, and then the next bullet major bullet point, once you get around to talking about them. So uh, as I mentioned, your audience can either read or listen. So having both of it, and especially having different content in both, uh, both cases, will not work. They will either take away, yeah, take away only one of them or nothing at all. Uh, so to reduce the time they spent on uh, reading, you should, you should keep your bullet points short and to the point. Uh, I tried a lot uh, to make sure that all the bullet points I have in this presentation are uh, not too long. So this is always one of the longer ones, especially the down go into the second line. So if you end up with a multi-line bullet point, consider do I actually need a, such a long bullet point? Can, can't I split it up somehow, make it multiple bullet points or reduce the uh, uh, sentence structure so that it's still understandable, but also a full bullet point. Do I just read off your slides? Yeah, I'm doing this a bit right now to guide the, uh, guide the presentation. Uh, but uh, the content that you was talking about shouldn't be uh, the one-to-one -one what you uh, have on your slides. So just reading off your slides, just making it an audiobook is not an option. And you could just, uh, then people could have just uh, read your report and uh, or your slides alone, then there's no point in the presentation. Visualizations is one of the strong suits of uh, presentation itself, because it enables you um, to include these images. And uh, as everyone says, an image has more than a thousand words. Creating um, visualizations for your own work. So being able to like draw a diagram, uh, like a UML diagram or just a component diagram or any other um, meaningful uh, visual representation of your work can be uh, really helpful to show what you have created or uh, what uh, discoveries you have made. Your slides shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be as distracting. So with modern technologies, we can do fancy stuff like having looping animations or videos on our slides. Uh, be careful with them and uh, control when they play and uh, how they play. Uh, because I've always seen presentations where there was like a looping uh, yeah, animation of uh, some data visualization or so, uh, or even some backgrounds that uh, move around. This, while this might seem fancy in the moment you create it, uh, if you stand them there in front of your audience and you talk and they, they see the peripheral vision all the time something moving, this is highly distracting for them. So they shouldn't, um, so, so you should avoid uh, having something like that in your presentation. Because 95% of the time, this is not productive. Some rare cases where we've seen uh, some people not making this a focus, for example, they built a simulation, and then they had a, um, had a looping animation of uh, one of the major elements of their simulation. This, uh, and they could just talk over it, talk uh, how, how they implemented each of these parts of the simulation. This was really helpful especially with the movement to understand how the simulation progresses. 
So in some cases that is uh, meaningful, but most cases it is not. The purpose of a slide. So that's why what you designed your slides for. Uh, in this case, I made these slides in a way that uh, they should be understandable without me speaking over them. In the sense that you have heard me talk once over them, then you use the slide deck later on uh, as a guide to create your presentations. So you can use them without me as a speaker. If you uh, think about lecture slides, these are often also very uh, extensive in the sense that they are also able uh, to be digested without having the lecturer talk over them often. I talk, uh, talk over them in most cases. Uh, but uh, for your presentations, I would rather go into a way where they support you as a speaker uh, and that only to some degree, some limited degree, understandable without your speaking. So they should mostly support you. So you can have images on there that do not have much explanation on that, but, it, uh, but that are still uh, able to be understood through your talking about it. Uh, but still consider that you, uh, if you lose your audience, for example, if you explain something complicated, some people might might just mentally turn off or just get lost. You should have these checkpoints at some point to say, hey, um, uh, we lost you there, but now you can come back for this next argument because I have the major points that you should take away on my slides. So, so this is what I mean with uh, having them be understandable to some degree. And then the form. So creating a slide, um, tools that you can do or can use for it. Uh, this presentation, for example, was created with LaTeX. We focus a lot on LaTeX here in this course at, and as we do use it for our working group a lot, but you can choose to use whatever tool you want or uh, what you are proficient with. So we recommend that you um, use LaTeX, that you uh, can use this uh, course as an opportunity to get to know it and experiment a bit with it. But if you are um, a yeah, dedicated PowerPoint, uh, uh, Zozi or Keynote or whatever user, and then uh, you can also use these tools. Uh, I won't, don't want to say you can use any tool that can in some way make slides. There are many, uh, some text tools where you can uh, trans uh, automatically generate slides from your text uh, data, which have very varying quality and are more often not that great in terms of results. So in order to produce a high quality presentation, please use a dedicated tool for creating your presentation. Uh, what we also like here a lot is having some form of section overview on every slide. This is what I, you see on the top here. Uh, so if you end, do not end up using, uh, for example, LaTeX with our template uh, or some other template that, for, uh, for, uh, that includes this, please uh, somehow include some form of section overview into your uh, tooling uh, with whatever you are using. But uh, if you're not able to do that, at least include the page number and total pages. So the bare minimum, if you present somewhere, should be the page number. As you can see in the bottom right here. Uh, so if someone wants to ask follow up uh, thought on uh, one of your slides, that they can just note on the page number or the slide number um, and use that to uh, better specify what their question was about. Uh, using this hierarchical bullet point, as we've seen so far, is a very common technique. Um, so avoid these multi-line bullet points, keeps them in uh, some form of structure that is homogeneous, not go too wide, uh, too far out of. Um, uh, make them too uh, too much different uh, and be consistent in your capitalization. So what I mean with this last point is, for example, I'm a big fan of just capitalizing all my bullet points. You can also make some lower case at the start. The English language uh, permits both. Um, just make it consistent. So switching around within a set of bullet points or even across multiple slides is just not good style. Mm. If you have uh, important visualizations and images, they can take an entire slide, so you can make them as big as you want. Uh, even if they hide uh, the navigation or page number, that's fine. Uh, the, uh, people can tell from the previous or next slide on what numbers they were. Uh, but if it makes it more understandable what this uh, visualization means, what uh, if there are lots of small details and you can talk over it uh, uh, a lot, then please do make them as big as you want. Having duplicate slides is also something that's pretty cheap. So you can just duplicate slides instead of going back. So having to go back through your slides for something that you have shown earlier is often not, uh, not good because it disorientates. Um, because you have, it's as, it's as if uh, you were starting telling a story and halfway through your story, you remember, oh, there was something that happened on day one that I didn't tell you about. <clears throat> and so you just, uh, end up jumping back to that other slide and then they're confused. Uh, was it not part of that slide? Is it part of the story here? Um, just make duplicates, it's cheap. Uh, you've seen it already with this one, with this uh, plan that I have shown you a few times now, uh, where we progress to it. 
I could just copy paste that slide multiple times, make a slight adjustment, and it's much cheaper than me having to go back to one of my first few slides. And then there yeah, uh, are too much text on the slide. So this is already a slide that's pretty full. I would say it's what's the limit of uh, in terms of how much text there should be on the slide. Uh, try to reduce it if possible. Once again, it goes back to this first rule I showed earlier. Uh, every element you have on a slide takes away attention from your audience. Having references, yes, references is something uh, that's important, of course, in a scientific context. Uh, and any, so anywhere where you need to um, put in uh, some sources for your claims. Uh, in a presentation, you would put the source for a claim on the same slide as the claim itself. You can, for example, use a footnote here in the middle. We have a macro for that in our slide template. I'll have an example later on where you can see how it looks. Uh, and it should always have a sort of full reference, including the, uh, the title and even the year or the name of the author. Uh, so we, the audience can see, ah, okay, this is from a book publication, uh, a paper uh, this is, that was paper, uh, published then and then. Uh, there are alternatively, there are these uh, shorthands with the uh, one or just number or the um, abbreviation, which you often see in reports or uh, papers. These are not uh, appropriate for presentations because uh, in a, a report or in a paper, the audience can or the reader can just jump to the reference section, check, ah, okay, this source is this, isn't that, and then they know what's going on. If you're in a presentation, you can't just jump to the reference section at the end and uh, check it. Uh, because you're in the presentation, you are up to the mercy of the presenter uh, who is guiding you through the, through the slide deck. So this uh, doesn't give you much information. So I would rather have the title of the presentation, uh, title of the source. And when selecting your sources, uh, make sure that if you have a controversial claim or something that is uh, yeah controversial, it's not common knowledge, you need stronger sources. So if you have something really controversial, uh, a blog post somewhere that someone made might not be enough, but having a paper might be uh, uh, necessary. If you go even more into it, have uh, highly controversial style claims um, that uh, maybe due to the background of your audience are really controversial, then you need also uh, maybe a publication that's in a re more renowned journal in that area compared to a more niche journal that accepts more papers. Uh, then the image sources also uh, have the same rules. So if you have an image, and you have not, you have to give the source. Uh, optimally, but uh, just below the image uh, in the caption, uh, taken from a source, image source so and so. Uh, uh, and if you made uh, changes to it, you just note it. It was edited. If you use stock images, uh, check the attribution rules. So sometimes um, you can freely use these images without attribution. Sometimes you have to uh, put in where you okay, uh, took them from or who the creator of them was. Just check uh, with the web page uh, and their licensing rules. And uh, at the end of the presentation, this is also my presentation, slide 50. Uh, this one is the uh, reference section. But normally you just have it there in case someone asks about it. If no one asks about it, you don't show it. So one more about slide titles. So these were sort of the basics right now. Slide titles are something slightly more advanced, but I think uh, it's also. Uh, uh, most of you should consider because it's something that's easily missed in terms of what potential is there. But if I switch to a new slide, you've noticed the first thing that you always read is the slide title. Because the biggest thing is at the top. And um, you're slightly disoriented when you go to the sli a new slide and want to know, okay, what's going on? What is this all about? Oh, you see the slide title. Okay, now I know what's going on. Now I can put this into context in my mind. Um, that's why the slide title is really powerful. And you should consider uh, consciously use it and be explicit about what you want, to, uh, what a slide is about. Next, so, now there's some advanced technique called the assertion evidence technique. So this idea, the idea here is that if you have, um, want to make a claim, uh, then you put always the claim itself into the title of the slide. From the context, it should be understandable what uh, the slide is about, uh, with uh, how you formalize as uh, will be ex explicit about the, this claim in the title. Then the slide itself would contain all the uh, evidence for said uh, claim. So we could first show uh, sort of uh, first showing the answer and then explaining the evidence. This can also be combined with this ABT structure. Uh, therefore, we should do this. So we have this therefore aspect, so a solution in the title, and then we put in a few arguments on the slide uh, why this is a solution, why people should do this. Um, why, why are we doing it this way? Because it's uh, from scientific studies, I found 
it's easier to remember for uh, people if they see um, already the answer in the top instead of uh, having to go through the entire slide and only then seeing the answer at the bottom. Because what people remember is that uh, they, okay, I remember this fact was true. I don't remember the argument for it, but I remember it because it was in the title. Um, so then also in, with titles, you can uh, be pretty aggressive about how you capitalize it. So you can just capitalize all the important words uh, in the title itself. Uh, there's some tools for it to make it easier, but in general, just try to capitalize everything that's important. Images on slides, you can also slides because it's an important word here. So if you have images on slides, a, a few rules for it. <clears throat> so we need to ensure that images have a good resolution. They're not pixelated in any way. We need to ensure that uh, if the Im images contain text, that the text itself on it is, is readable. Um, so if you export uh, the slides, uh, so your images from some other, other source, uh, please don't just make a screenshot of it on your on your monitor. It might end up being too small if you then uh, make it bigger on your slide. Uh, so try to, for example, extract it from the original source by just, uh, if you have, for example, a paper and you have an image you want to use from that paper, you can use tools that extract all the image files from that paper. And with that, you get them in original quality. Or if you use it, um, if you get it from Google search or something, then uh, and you know you can use it. Uh, don't use the thumbnail, the smaller version. Use a, try to find the big original version of it, such as it's easy, readable, and looks nicely on your slides, nice and sharp. Make sure the images are not complex. Uh, this goes in the direction that if you're talking about against our, uh, our papers and the images, so scientists really like to create complicated images to explain their work. But these complicated images might be too complex to understand for an audience and to digest uh, in, uh, inside a presentation. So try to um, make them either simpler or not use them at all, or make may, may, maybe make a simplified version of it, or use a sub aspect of uh, of the image. Um, Sorry. Uh, so when uh, selecting images, make sure that um, you consider these aspects. Uh, when you have an image on a slide, and it's not just a stock image, but a central element of that slide, give uh, your audience enough time to understand it. You can even walk your audience, if it's a diagram, say, yeah, we have, we have this aspect, and we have there this aspect of the image, uh, and this goes together here. Just walk them through it uh, calmly and help them understand all parts of it. So if you end up using an image, for example, from a publication, and there are parts of it uh, that go beyond what you are saying in your presentation, or maybe even beyond what I've understood about the topic, make sure that uh, you can still explain all parts of an image. So it's same with what you have say or what you write on your slides. If you put something out there, you must be able to explain or talk about it. If you do not, if it's not relevant to your uh, to your work, or you can't uh, fully explain it. Um, then you shouldn't use it, or if it's not relevant to your work or your presentation, then you should just edit it out and then note that it was edited. Okay, continuing with tables. So a table is not something that should be included on the slide if possible. Because having as a full table is equivalent to just having a block of text. And it takes a lot of time for an audience look through the table, say, okay, where am I? I'm there. Okay, this data is bigger than that. Especially if they have a numeric and they need to compare numbers. Our brains are not good at comparing numbers intuitively, especially if it's like they are floating point numbers and they need to then they need to compare, okay, this is about what factor? 10, maybe it's that factor 20 and so on. So this takes a lot of time. So you need to um, uh, make this as easy as possible for the audience if you do end up having to use an, a table. Um, so you need to use highlighting to, uh, to highlight the relevant parts, only show the relevant columns, uh, rows and columns, if there's a table with additional parts. And uh, still, if you consider it, try to make it a graph. Just really try to make it a graph if you can and have the table in your backup slides or somewhere and avoid uh, having to show a table in a presentation or uh, use a lot of highlighting to make sure that they only look at the relevant parts. That's also code since we are in a Software environment, uh, and computer science environment, you might be showing uh, parts of your algorithms. You can show pseudo code, you can show explicit uh, code in a program language. Um, but uh, there are some uh, considerations. For example, how do you include it? So, with LaTeX, you can just do a code listing. There's some nice uh, templates for it in our, um, our, well, in our template. Um, but you can uh, sometimes you also might end up using screenshots. So, with screenshots, there's nothing wrong. 
uh, explicitly with screenshots. However, if you use multiple of them, uh, and then you have to uh, resize them partially, maybe, uh, then uh, it ends up uh, being the case that uh, consistent, and this doesn't look as nice uh, over across your presentation. So I would preferably would use a code listing where you have the code directly in your uh, presentation tool and the, um, uh, the, uh, the rendering of the code and the highlighting is done through the presentation tool. Uh, the support for that might vary depending on the tool you're using. Uh, but there are also some tools that can um, do this like to pre-generate sort of these screenshots in a consistent manner. So you can also look for those. Uh, then the yeah, code also is kind of would be considered a text uh, related to our earlier rules about how much text should be on a slide. Uh, so you need to somehow make it easy to adjust. Uh, you can use highlighting comments, just guide them calmly through it, only include the relevant parts. So if you have, for example, a Python script, you might not need to include the import statements if it's uh, clear what uh, where they are coming from, but you just uh, would include the main algorithm that uh, is doing the heavy lifting there. So formulas. Formulas is, since some of you might be from math backgrounds or from uh, more theoretical parts of computer science, you might end up uh, wanting to use formulas on your slides. So with uh, average computer scientists, uh, this, this might be a bit hard to understand and to pass. So we, we can work with formulas often, but we need more time than compared to people who work with it daily. Uh, that's why I don't think they make a good, uh, they're not good in a presentation. Um, but yeah, once again, consider your audience. If it's an audience who is comfortable, put, uh, put them in and be done with it. Otherwise, if you do end up needing to include a formula, make sure to guide your audience through it, connect uh, to your argument. And uh, if they end up not understanding what the formula is about, still provide your takeaway message. Say, okay, this uh, formula means we can have now, if we increase this number, we get more out of that number or something like that. Or we found a solution for this problem. We have this calculation, we can just model it uh, and so on. Uh, and yeah, if you do end up avoiding it and you still need to include it, use qualitative arguments or describe, uh, maybe via some ex also, also via some examples, what is going on. So backup slides, something I mentioned, these are, uh, would be extra slides that uh, are after the end of your presentation uh, that you might or might not be showing to your audience. Uh, the purpose of them is, uh, if, for example, if you are practicing your presentation, you might get nervous and you speak faster and uh, in order to avoid it, you have to finish early because you spoke, uh, went through your slides too fast. You might uh, have backup slides that allow you to um, extend your presentation a bit until you are within the expected presentation time. Also, another aspect, if you end up uh, in a round where you're expected to be asked questions about your, uh, also what you have done, you want to have uh, these extra slides in order to be answered set questions. Uh, and you can just jump to, ah, yeah, I have this data, here's the table through that graph, uh, we can just talk about it here. Uh, presentation is also a very hard part, because what, to, what should we say at the end? What should we do at the end? We mentioned this conclusion part. So we have or definitely have the summary at the end, where we talk about uh, major con contributions, decisions, opinions, also on, especially opinion. Like towards the end, you would um, include the, my, in person, my personal opinion, this field is not developed that well because I found the software there is not that usable right now. Most of this is in an experimental state or so, or not a mature state. This is an opinion. This is very valid to give at the end of a presentation. Just make sure that this, yeah, in my, uh, to state that it's your personal opinion uh, in that part. Mm. For the final slide, there's a very common thing that I see often is these questions, question mark slide, or this thank you for a listening slide or just showing the reference slide at the end. These are all not good endings for a presentation. So what you want from, your, from the end of your presentation is something that the people can use uh, to ask questions or something that gives them a good feeling at the end. So you can, uh, for example, have, this, uh, have a quote at the end. Uh, that's what I did with the other presentation that this quote, uh, but I didn't end up using it. You can have some salute instead of saying, thank you for listening, as in uh, you thank your audience that they, they stuck through the presentation uh, with you. Uh, you did them a service with your presentation. So you do something like, well, like this salute, a salute or you have a joke at the end. So it gives them a good feeling that way or have some call to action. So this is a very common way that I like presentation, for example, is that just saying, yeah, with that well, being said, you're now able to give qualitative presentations. So, and yeah, since thank you has been sort of ingrained to us from uh, learning to present, 
uh, this is a habit that uh, you have to get rid of. And this is one of the harder parts, I would say. So one more thing about slide design. So if you have done all these parts previously, and now you have your presentation there, you have you know, images on your presentation, and then you go through it, and you want to make it a bit more fancy, a bit more nicer to look at. There's some things you should consider. So slide backgrounds, keep them simple. Everything that's not monocolored uh, or, uh, or it's not a nice contrast to your text is hard to read. If you use colors, make sure, uh, try to avoid uh, having uh, information encoded in colors. Uh, of course, at certain audience sizes, we have to consider that uh, people might be colorblind. So you need to check either your coloring screens or do not encode information in coloring. You can still use highlighting with coloring, uh, such as an underline or something uh, that is, doesn't include additional information. Uh, positioning of text, image, and block. So if you use LaTeX, you might need to uh, end up adjusting the placement of your images to make it uh, look more nicer. Or if the image is not fully on the slide, you can, for example, use this bspace command uh, and it increase the uh, number here until it fits on the slide. Uh, in terms of slides and minutes, try to avoid having more slides than you have minutes. If you have more uh, too many slides, try moving to the backup slides or um, you should need to cover the stuff. So we're getting closer to the end. So uh, now we're going to talk about practice uh, talking that we have now uh, slides. Because I do encourage you, if you prepared all the stuff, you should at least practice your talk uh, once or twice, at least to understand um, how much time you need to spend on what part. So this is split into a message or what you want to talk about in the body language. So uh, what we want to say is we want to tell them, as I mentioned earlier, is the story, the slides itself are there to support you, get these bullet points as checkpoints, in, uh, so the audience, if they don't uh, fully get what you are saying, the skill can look at the slide to understand what's going on. Uh, always summarize uh, what's going on. So if you have some major parts, if you have, for example, this major section uh, in your pr presentation before you go into the next major section, you can give a short summary of the previous part. So even if the audience didn't understand the details, they still know, okay, what are the takeaways of the given message? Uh, you can announce what's coming up. So this is what I just did, for example. Uh, what the section will be about, so they can uh, yeah, they can adjust the expectations, mm. making comments and so on. So uh, I'm not just reading and giving factual statements about what we are seeing here. Making small comments, I'm talking about giving some anecdotes and so on to make this more or more interesting. So this is what I mean with this comment part. Uh, yeah, sentences. If you do it, uh, do writing, you might uh, end up writing really nice and fancy sentences that are. Um, flow and a, a pleasure to read, you don't, but you don't talk like this. You talk with simple sentences. The sentences are often not too complicated. Uh, they are easy to follow. They have uh, clear endings and their meaning is uh, yeah, mostly clear. So that's how you would also talk in your presentation. Uh, yeah, have these uh, recalls to your structure uh, throughout, especially with longer presentations. And uh, yeah, don't include too many details. Like, be, don't be overwhelming. So how to speak. So if you're not used to speaking, uh, especially giving a presentation, make sure that you project your voice, that you speak loud and clear, that you can test if you're, uh, how well you're audible, just some, uh, either by testing with a friend or a colleague or with a supervisor, how clear you're audible to us through your um, setup here, or by just going to the echo chamber and listening back to your own voice. <clears throat> Adjust your speed. Make sure that your speed is uh, easily understood. I said that we have an uh, international audience here, so I try to not speak as fast as I would, for example, if I speak in German, I speak a bit faster because I know my uh, other people could either understand me. No, you speak calmly, adjust to your audience, especially if they are not all native speakers of whatever language you are using. And then yeah, be do emphasis on the important points. Uh, this is also in the direction of what I mentioned earlier with don't use monotonous speaking or voice. So when you're speaking, your position is that you are the person to talk about your topic. You're... That's why you're giving the presentation. So that's why you're allowed to make yourself bigger. Like don't slouch over or slide down in your chair or somewhere be close to your microphone uh, and make yourself uh, big and uh, have a good posture. If you are talking in person, that would also mean that you point your toes and your torso towards your audience. It means uh, so straight facing them, having a straight stance, Having mostly an open face, don't make mean faces or uh, look to, look to, uh, sad or something, but give off uh, some, uh, some friendly and energetic, uh, some energy. Some have uh, purposeful movements. 
this is uh, if you're nervous during a presentation and for example if i would like, hold my phone the entire time and do something with it because i'm nervous this would just be distracting for you if i did this the entire time of course so i'm not doing that this is my movements my hand gestures are purposefully um they have a beginning to an end i'm not just constantly doing something and not, not stopping with it because my, all my movements are purposeful if you're uh, also standing in front uh, during a standing presentation do not hide your hands in your pockets or behind your back have them in front of you somewhere you can make these uh, gesture, uh, gestures gesture towards your slides you don't even need to have anything meaningful on that slide in this moment you can just gesture towards your slide uh, for the sake of it this actually works um and uh, yeah, when you do a presentation in person and you're for example in a seminar room and you call to the front person so and so give you a talk you wouldn't start talking until you're at the front uh, so you move to the front start talking stand uh, in front of the audience and only then move behind the podium and really get started if there's a podium so some gotchas uh, related to that so don't look at your slides too much like in this context right now it's easy i can just look at my slides and at you at the same time because they're on top of each other but if you are in a, in a setting where you have the slides behind you, uh, because you are in a, well, you have a projector that's throwing the slides behind you, you have the audience in front of you, don't try to talk like this, where you just look at your slides the entire time and you're barely audible because you are, lo are looking at the audience. Uh, one common technique is to pick like two to three people. Like I try to pick like someone le uh, on the left side, someone on the right side, someone in the back. And I will just go through these three people from time to time to make sure I look into the audience. So yeah, first walk to the front and then only then start speaking, which I mentioned. Um, if you are done with your talk, don't leave the stage until the applause has died down. Avoid these nervous movements, like tapping with a foot or sh uh, shaking something. Uh, hide not, don't hide your hands or hold something uh, that you don't need. If you pick up some object, like just pick it, uh, put it down if you don't need it for your talk. If you need to hold a microphone, you of course need to hold it. That's fine. Don't be too serious, like uh, just have some energy uh, that doesn't, uh, is not too serious and uh, don't cross your legs when standing. So this last point is um, something if you are just standing there, you usually have a standing leg and sort of a play leg. So you're just, uh, so standing slightly to the side or to the other one. And sometimes this is more, uh, more common with women than with men. But they then put their, for example, their um, right foot uh, to the left of their left foot. Because it's just comfortable, uh, more comfortable to stand like this, or to yeah, it's just, just a way to use uh, stand. Sometimes this is not good to do when doing a presentation. Try to stand, have a good stance in front of your audience. Okay, with that we conclude on practice talking. We have uh, now co covered our entire plan here. I will now give a short uh, um, section on feedback and how you uh, give and receive feedback. Because it's also something that will be expected as part of this course. And then uh, my conclusion, and then we are done, uh, done for today, and we can do a Q and A, and then we are done. So feedback. So when uh, you're giving feedback, uh, it's about kind of giving constructive criticism, constructive feedback. So to first start with acknowledging what the presenter has done well, what uh, their strengths are, and then point out where they can improve things, and always suggest an approach for improvement. Or if you don't know, uh, know a way to improve it, such say, yeah, I think this could be done better, but I don't know exactly where to improve there. But, but always try to come up with something, if you uh, if possible, on how they can improve it. Um, in order to give qualitative feedback, you shouldn't just rely on remembering everything. Just really take notes, write down the slide number, and uh, then uh, that slide. And then you can ask them, hey, go please to back to that slide. Yeah, I didn't understand that part, or um, could, uh, this uh, slide was a bit distracting with that element there. Um, if you notice a presentation where there's a lot going on, where you think okay this person has uh, more points to, to improve uh, focus on the, uh, the most significant points where can they make the most progress on improving their presentation before moving on to the smaller details so just focus on the big points then uh, some aspects of feedback so it's just a list of ideas that you can look at so was the takeaway message clear was talking and engaging and so on so i would go through all this so if you do end up preparing um, feedback for a fellow student uh, in terms of uh, um, in terms of their presentation, and then just uh, to look at this to give you some ideas on uh, what uh, questions you can answer when uh, preparing feedback. Then one more thing about receiving feedback. So when um, when you have given your presentation and you uh, 
and the position of uh, taking in feedback, don't get defensive. Just accept the feedback the audience has for you. It should hopefully be uh, constructive with points how you can improve it. Be open-minded about their opinions. Um, it's just, they're all valid in terms of they are in the audience. They have, you made the talk for the audience. So they are, um, uh, how they perceive it is uh, is really valid. Ask clarifying questions if there's something unclear about it. Um, and if you uh, this contractor feedback, uh, you can ask for uh, actual steps on how to make the improvements and to make your uh, this feedback actually actionable, you should also take notes. So with that, we have compared feedback. Now just my closing, uh, closing remarks, and then we're done with this. So with that, that we have now uh, covered uh, about almost 60 minutes in terms of quality, uh, scientific presentation content, you should now be empowered to give high, really high quality presentations. You can spread your ideas, spread your stories, use it in the context of this course and other courses or in your career. And uh, if you're unsure how to proceed, please go back just to this plan and utilize it. Uh, but this is just one aspect from one baseline to do it. And you need to experiment with it uh, to find uh, your own style on purposes. So this is, if you look at uh, many uh, famous presenters, if you look at how um, Steve Jobs did his presentations, you find a much different style. Like, of course, he has his all very much his own um, uh, own style. So you need to also find your own. Uh, you can use, use a slide deck. It's all available on the web page. And if you need to uh, have more reading, there's this uh, craft of scientific presentations. Here you can see an example of using the source um, macro, where it shows you the author and the name of the book. With that, I think you're fully empowered to give me the best presentations I've seen in my life, because I've now taught you uh, most things I know. Of course, there's much, much more. This is all I could cover about an hour. Uh, but yeah, please go out and make great presentations.